All right. Um, today we're going to talk about sort of two things interweave hand in hand. We're going to talk about web design and we're going to talk about your project. Which makes sense because your project is something that you want to make sure that it is well designed. So, in order for it to be well designed, it's important uh, that you follow a certain um, certain model, a certain process to get from a rough idea of what your project is going to be to sort of the final result of what it's going to be. So. There's a few of you here. Um, does anyone care to volunteer what one of your favorite websites is? Yes. YouTube. Okay, what do you like about YouTube? All right, very easily interactable. Uh, in other words, and I'll, and let me know if I'm misstating what you're trying to say. In other words, you can easily find what you want to find. Uh, also, I would imagine you like it because there's tons of content on there. Right, a any literally any video that you would possibly think of that you can find. Uh, good example. Do you care to volunteer a favorite website? Netflix. All right. And what do you like about that? All right, it uh, has uh, categories that sort of help guide you find stuff that you might be interested in. Now, notice a couple of things. A lot of people, when they think of web design, the first thing they think of is, well, in web design, we're going to talk about the fonts that we're going to use. We're going to talk about the colors that we're going to use and so on. But I'll bet if you listed your favorite website, you wouldn't say that you like YouTube because you like the color scheme, right? You're not going to say you like Netflix because you like the fonts that they use, all right? People like, a web, people like websites because they help them achieve their goals, whatever the goals may be. And the goals are going to be different from site to site. So, the purpose of web design is not just to make the page look good, but to make the site such that it will serve the user's goals. All right, that's the most important thing. And if it serves the user's goals, that's the first step in the process to making the website well designed. So we're gonna follow a process that we're gonna go through, and we are first going to Define the goals. And the goals exist for both the person viewing the site and the person who makes the site. In other words, Netflix has goals too, right? They're not just doing this out of the goodness of their heart. You know, they have something in mind that they want to achieve. And therefore, the site ought to be set up so that it's easy for them to achieve their goals. Same thing with YouTube, same thing with any other site that you uh, can think of. Uh, in some cases, uh, the goal might be to buy from our site. In other cases, the goal might be to attract you, to come into your site, uh, to come into your, I mean, your physical location. For example, most auto dealerships have uh have have websites right and they'll show an inventory of their cars and so on now but most uh, automobile websites don't try to sell you the car online they just want to get you into their location so then the sales rep can do their thing and try to get you in the car all right so the goal depends on the particular site whereas amazon wants you to buy from them a car dealership might just want to get you on the car lot so that they can sell to you one-on-one. -on -one. So, 
the first step of the process is defining the goals. And remember, goals exist for the site and the users. Now, one thing that's important in web design is that we don't necessarily, well, we'll save this for later. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to define the content to achieve the goals. So, what, on a car dealership, let's say, what content will help the car dealership and the customer to achieve their goals? Well, a valid inventory, an up-to-date inventory of the cars that are on, on the site would be one big thing. The hours that the, that the place is open, that would be another thing. A contact, give contact information for people to uh, contact if they have questions about something on the site and so on, all right? So we define the goals in the first step. In the second step, we figure out what content is going to help achieve those goals. All right, so that's step number two. Step number three is how is that best organized? So we're going to organize the content. So for example, you mentioned Netflix. They have things organized by category and they have uh, recommendations. They organize the movies by recommendations and by category and by new releases and so on. They found a particular way to organize the content on the page that works well for them. All right. Many websites have a lot of content on them. All right. So if a website has good content, that's one thing. But a second thing is, can you find that content that you're interested in? All right. Let's say instead of categories, Netflix just had an alphabetized list of all their movies. All right. Well, that'd be very difficult to find a movie that you were interested in watching that way, unless you happen to know the name of it. But if you're just in the mood for comedy, and you looked at an alphabetized list of all the movies on Netflix, that wouldn't work for you. That would be ridiculous, right? Because that content is not very well organized. So the third step of the process is where you organize the content. Same thing for a car dealership. They probably would have a page devoted to their car lot, the hours, the service hours, contact phone numbers, contact email addresses. They probably would have a page for new cars. They probably would have a page for used cars and so on. So it's not only important to develop the content as develop a way to organize the content to make it easy to find. Can any of you think of a website that might have good content but is really difficult to navigate, really difficult to find. I can think of one, and maybe I should shut the mic off for this one, but I think kind of our website's kind of hard to find stuff on. Lorraine Community College's website. I, I don't know, do any of you have that experience? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I sometimes have a hard time finding what I'm interested in. For example, it's, I, I wanted to look up what our vision plan was, all right, over the weekend, you know, to schedule an eye doctor's appointment. That's probably somewhere on the website, but I don't know where it is, you know, and I don't feel like taking the time to look through pages till I find it. So, um, at any rate, um, there are other websites like that too. We're certainly not the only uh, victim of that. Um, the next step is to get an overall structure of the page. And that overall structure is called a wireframe. Now a wireframe 
is something like this. If we go to Amazon, let's say, notice as, a, as we go from page to page that there's going to be certain portions of the page that are the same. There's a banner on the top. There's search over here. There's a place to log in. There's your shopping cart. And there's a set of links up here. If we go to customer service, guess what? That top stays the same. Also, the bottom part of it stays the same. So the header, navigation, content, and footer. Those are all things that we talked about. A wireframe is simply a rough sketch of how we want our page in general to be organized, how we want each specific page to be organized. For example, I think I picked the wrong kind of document here. Let's try this again. Oh, is it making me buy it to, to draw a document? Wow, that stinks. Oh, no, here we go. This might be our page. We might have our navigation as a column along the left side of the page. We may have a header that goes like this. We might have our content in a block like this. And then finally, we might have a footer on the bottom of the page. That's what I mean by a wireframe, all right? In other words, it doesn't show the specifics of the content, doesn't say what's in the header, doesn't say what's in the navigation, but it's sort of blocks of how the main areas of the page are gonna be arranged. We can probably Google it and come up with other examples of wireframes. And wireframes can be very, Simple or they can be more involved. Like, here's an example of a little more involved wireframe. Of how a page might look. There's a banner on the top, a search button, Navigation, oh no, the search is down here. A main video here, some pictures over here, a list of things, and so on down the line. So this is a more detailed wireframe than the one that I sketched out. The last step of the design process is coming up with a prototype. Can anyone define what a prototype is? Or think of another word that is similar to prototype. Any thoughts? Yes. 
a test drawn. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, a model would be another way to put it. Uh, it would be like a rough draft in an English class. In other words, in English class, if you're writing a term paper, you know, you're not going to try to go and just type out the term paper from beginning to end. All right, all in one shot. Ideally, what you'll do is you'll come up with a rough draft. You'll go over it. Maybe you'll give it to your teacher or other people to look at and to make suggestions. And then you make revisions and come up with the final version of it. <clears throat> the process is very similar with websites. All right. And to do so, we create prototypes. Now, remember, most of the time, or much of the time, rather, we're making websites for other people. All right. Sometimes we're making a website just for ourselves. But a lot of times we're making websites for either the company that hired us. All right or a company that contracted with us as a consultant to come in and develop their website or whatever. So what you do in a prototype is you take a shot at all the things that comprise a website, the fonts, the colors, and so on. And you present that, and these are finished HTML and CSS pages, all right, relatively finished and you show them to the person you're developing the website to. And they'll make some suggestions, like maybe the navigation should be a different color to make it stand out more. Or maybe the header needs to be a little bit smaller, that way we can fit more content on the page. Or whatever. Or I like that color scheme. Or I don't like that color scheme. I think those fonts look well on the page. I don't think those fonts look particularly good on the page, and so on, all right? So the prototype is where we get into the actual, what the page is going to look like. And we make a few sample pages. Now, they don't have to be complete. They don't have to have all the content that you're going to do. Sometimes, if you are waiting for another department to provide you with maybe the words that are going to be on the page, you'll just mock up and put what's called Greek text on the page, all right? Uh, or if you have a photograph and you're waiting to get the photograph from the marketing department or whatever, you'll put in another photograph as sort of a placeholder. So it doesn't have to be completely 100% finished or polished, but it should be enough to give people an idea of what your website's going to look like and how you navigate around it. So these are the five steps. And in our project, we have five parts of the project design that we're gonna talk about where each of the steps of the project sort of break, uh, you know, become a different uh, section of the, of, the, of the design. So let's go to Canvas. And let's look at your pro, uh, program or project design. So there's a separate module for the project. All right. And there's the overview. And there is the instructions for the design and the uh, instructions for the final project and then two drop boxes. This is due on March 30th. Now, that probably seems like a long time from now, but believe me, time flies, all right? So therefore, the earlier that you can start on this, the better. Start thinking of ideas of what you want your project to be. Start thinking about what 
the goals would be for someone visiting your site or what your goals would be if you were the person that was making the site for real. All right, project overview. We'll take a second to look at that. It's open-ended. You can pick pretty much whatever topic that you want to provide it as appropriate for a college level class. The final project should be six to eight pages. All right, you can read through the rest of that on your own. The project design. Here's where we come up with sections that sort of answer those questions that were in the Word document of what the goals are, what content we're going to have, how is it going to be organized, how is a basic page laid out, and finally, what are the pages going to look like. The first section is called a strategy section. The strategy section, you define a couple of things. First of all, you give an overview of what the project is. Let's say I'm going to do a website about skiing. All right, that's fine. Now, there could be any number of websites that you could create about skiing and they could all be different. You could create a website that explained the different kind of skiing equipment. And, and give advice about purchasing skiing equipment. You could do a website about covering the skiing events at the Olympics and say who, who won a gold medal in this event, who won a gold medal in that event. You could do a how-to ski website. So when you pick your topic, be as specific as possible. All right, the more specific that you can define your site, and the site goals, the better chance you have to achieving your goals. So you wanna be specific and you wanna include that sort of a thought of who the audience of this is gonna be. And we'll get more to audience in a second. If I was doing a skiing site for children, for example, or I say children, but younger people, I might do one thing and have it organized a certain way. If I was doing a website for people that already skied and want to get better at it, I might do it a different way and so on. So you want to define your audience. Second thing that you want to do is define the goals of the website, both for you and for your users. And you're gonna come up with three goals three goals for the maker of the site and three goals for each persona. So let's get back to our ski example. If I was, let's say a ski resort and I wanted to, uh, you know, make a website, one of my goals would probably be to get people to come to my ski resort. So that would be one of the goals. A second goal might be to teach people how to ski, right? People aren't gonna come to my ski resort if they don't know how to ski, all right? So if I teach people how to ski, maybe that will get them coming in. And maybe a third site is maybe I have at my ski resort, I have a pro shop where you can buy things or order things. So maybe you would want to sell things in our, in our shop. So that might be my three goals as the maker of the site. We also are going to have three goals for each persona. Now, what is a persona? A persona is a... A, a person that you make up that is representative 
of a group of users that are going to be visiting your site. All right. People sometimes make a mistake when they talk about the user visiting our site, because really there's a bunch of users visiting your site and they all have different goals. All right. Let's think of Lorain County Community College, their website. Um, who are different groups of users that would be visiting Lorain Community College's website? Name a group. High school kids, thinking about what to do, particularly high school seniors, but maybe younger too, thinking about what they're planning on doing or, you know, next year. They might visit the website to see what the course offerings are. Think of another group. Yeah. Professors. Professors on the weekend looking up what the AI plan is, all right, would be one good example of that. Think of a third example. Current students, all right. Fourth example, care to volunteer one? Parents of kids, right. Then you could go on and on and on, right? You could have people that are working and are thinking maybe of changing careers. People that are working and want to advance in their particular career. In other words, maybe you're a software developer and you want to learn new skills that you haven't learned already. All right. Uh, maybe you're a company and you want to get training for your people. Maybe you're a member of the community and you want to see what events are at the Stalker Center. There's a lot of different people that could be visiting Lorain County Community College's website. And they all have goals, all right? They all have goals. Now, some of those goals are common between many of the different groups. For example, a high school student, a current student, and a person switching careers might wanna look at the different degree offerings that we have. So they might wanna see what kind of degrees do we offer here? What programs do we have, all right? So that would be a goal that those three groups would have in common. But maybe some of the goals are more important to one group than the other. For example, maybe seeing when the courses are scheduled, seeing where evening classes are or online classes might be more important to people who are already working, right? Because they have a job to go to and they need to schedule their class around as opposed to someone who is a full-time student. All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to find three personas. You're going to make people up. You're going to give them a name. All right. You're going to pick out a photograph for them. All right. Now that photograph could be just something you find on the web. Be sure to give credit to where you found it. But it's representative of a particular group of people. Let's look up. Let's Google persona and see what we get. All right, here's a persona. This is for a hypothetical shoe company, all right? Brandy Taylor, their profile, they have narrow feet, all right? Now, here's where you have to read between the lines a little bit, all right? It says narrow feet, but does that mean we're gonna have a narrow feet section on our website? Not necessarily. What this is talking about is maybe people that have certain specific needs, all right? So for some people, it might be that they have narrow feet. For other people, it might be they have wide feet. For other people, it might they have big feet. For other people, it might be that they have little feet, all right, and so on. So what she sort of represents are people that have needs outside of the ordinary for the product that you're selling. You should be able to accommodate them as well. And therefore, 
You might have a persona defined as just your average person looking for shoes. You might have her defined as someone who has special needs as far as her shoes go. And what they do is they actually make a name. They gave her a name. They found a picture. I don't know where they got the picture, stock photos or whatever. They gave a quote to give you an idea. It's so difficult to buy feet. And motivation. Brandy gets very emotional shopping about shoes in retail stores because she can rarely find a pair that fits her narrow feet. All right, and so on. Her goals, find a very small shoe. If she finds a shoe she likes, or she finds several shoes she likes, she might be willing to buy a multiple pairs. All right, hoping that she doesn't have to sacrifice style or options when searching for. Frustrations, all right, not being able to filter by width. Getting fewer options when she applies a filter, no recommended shoes. All right. You might have a similar case of people that, like, if they're shopping for clothing, um, I bought this sweater recently and I really like it. So I might go and buy more just like it. So if I would have had the money at the time, I probably would have ordered not just this sweater, but multiple sweaters. So the idea is, is when you show one product, show recommended products that go along with it, all right? Or maybe they'd show a pair of pants that went with the sweater, all right? Or a shirt or something like that. But that's what a persona is. And each persona has their own goals. And the goals might overlap, or they might be unique to a particular group, all right? But either way, you're going to come up with that. Now, how many personas do you come up with? In the real world, that's difficult because there's a lot of people that could be visiting your site, right? There is theoretically 7 billion different people that could visit your site. Well, you can't come up with 7 billion different personas. So what do you do? Well, you think of the most representative groups of people that are gonna visit your site. Maybe you take surveys of what kind of people, uh, you know, uh, is interested in your organization or so on, all right? I, when we talked about Lorraine Community College a minute ago, we talked about, off the top of our heads, we talked about six or seven personas, and it wouldn't be too hard to come up with a few more, all right? That's one of the reasons why it's such a big site and why at times it might be difficult to navigate. It's trying to solve a bunch of different people's needs. All right, I'm gonna make it easy for you. You only have to come up with three personas, all right? And that should not be too hard. If you have difficulty, let me know and I'll help you. Let's go back to our skiing example. Uh, one person, might be someone that knows how to ski, but wants to improve. Yeah, I went skiing a couple times, but you know, I was really shaky. You know, I, I really wasn't doing too good of a job. All right, you might have a section for them. Or, you, or let me rephrase that. You might not necessarily have a section, but you're gonna have content for them. All right, another group may be someone that has never been on skis in their life. All right, and a third group might be a parent who knows how to ski and wants to bring their kid to the resort who's never skied or something along those lines. All right, all those things are examples of personas and they might have similar needs or they might have different needs. It's up to you to define that and then you go about addressing those needs. All right, almost every topic you can think of, you sort of get two personas off the bat, all right? People that know your topic, people that don't know your topic. So if you're talking about doing a website for a band, you might have uh, information for fans of the band versus people that don't know the band but are interested, all right? If you're talking about a restaurant, you might have your regular customers and people that wanna find someplace different to eat, all right? So you automatically sort of get those two personas and then you just need to come up with a third. And if you really are stuck, let me know and we'll work on it together and come up with a third persona.
Now, what do we do with these personas? We carry them through the whole design process. In other words, if we're confused about how should we organize this, or what content do we need on the site? Look at it through the eyes of your persona. What would help Brandy find the shoes that she likes? Well, maybe a separate link for narrow shoes. That might be one solution. Another solution might be, we'll just give the ability to search among our inventory, but give the width of the shoes as an option. That might work as well. That's web design just as much as picking out the fonts and the colors, deciding what approach you're going to take to satisfy those goals. But in order to satisfy those goals, you first have to identify them. And that's what we do in the strategy section. You identify the goals both for you and for typical groups of your users, those personas. By the way, steps one through four all of these are done just in a Word document. The last one are actual HTML pages. All right, so you define the goals. You have a list of things that, that, that you and the people visiting your site want to achieve by visiting your site. All right. After you do this, you define the content to achieve those goals. These are sometimes called requirements. And they're, they're usually stated in the form of a sentence that says the site will have, and then a statement. So maybe in the ski example, a sample requirement will be the site will have three video lessons for beginners. That would be an example of a requirement. All right. Is a statement of the content that's going to be on the site. All right. A statement of the content that's going to be on the site. Other requirements, the site will have a page that shows hours, location, and contact info. All right, we're doing for a restaurant, the site will contain a menu of what we serve, all right? I always, anytime someone suggests to me that we go to a restaurant that I'm like not familiar with, that's the first thing I do online is I start strategizing what I'm gonna order by going to their website and picking out two or three dishes I'm interested in and then I'll make the final decision when I'm there. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever go to the brunch at the Fev but uh, it's in Oberlin and they have really good brunch. Uh, and if anyone in the Feb is watching this video, uh, you know, I do, I would take a paid endorsement by the way uh, for this, but they put out a different uh, brunch menu every month to just show you. I'll tell you the first of the month, I'm always going online to look at what that is so I can plot for the rest of the month. Well, okay, the first, well, I'll probably get blueberry pancakes, and the second, I'll probably get this omelet. And the third. It, it's a big deal, right? It really helped me achieve my goals to have a menu. And I would think any restaurant, it would achieve their goals. All right? What about the person with the shoes? Did we talk about her already? Uh, that we could have a, either a section or we could have a search capability. Here's where we decide which one, all right? So maybe the requirement will be the site will allow you to search by size, width, and price, maybe something along those lines. Now, here's the thing about these requirements.
requirements should should match up with goals. Now, what I mean by that is not necessarily every goal is going to have one requirement. Nor do I mean that every requirement only has one goal associated with it. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. One goal might be satisfied by several requirements. All right. Or a given requirement might solve the needs of um, many different users, many different user types. So what you would do is you would make sure they match up though, because every goal better have at least one requirement associated with it. Because if you've identified a goal of your users and you don't have any content to address that, you probably haven't thought it through enough. You probably need to add some content to your site. Now, the flip side is true. If you have content, if you're planning on having content on your site that doesn't match up with the user's goal, well, then maybe you don't need that content on the site. Maybe that will just serve to clutter the site. For example, all right, um, biography of the chef. Is that important? Maybe for certain kinds of restaurants, it might be important, right? Important, the real fancy one. Do I care who is making my blueberry pancakes at the Fev? No, because I know all their cooks are good, right? I don't need to know the biography of each individual one. I know they're going to do a good job. So, no, I don't necessarily need to see their biographies. If I was a ski resort, would I put a biography of the ski instructor? Yes, that might help me decide if I was a user, is this a good ski resort to go to or not? If this person has been teaching for 20 years and is very experienced and so on, that might lead me to want to go to a particular ski resort as opposed to another one. So you have to look at and make sure that every goal has at least one requirement and every requirement goes to at least one goal. And I would suggest numbering these and then cross-referencing them. So next to a goal, put the number of the requirement that addresses it. And along, alongside each requirement, put the number of goal that it addresses. And you better have something in for each goal and each requirement, otherwise you haven't finished your job yet. All right, the next step is to organize the content. And this really relates to navigation. These things decide what's gonna be on the website. But you could organize that dozens of different ways. Is everything gonna be on one page? No, probably not. Is every requirement gonna have its own page? Also probably not. So how are you gonna group things together to form a cohesive and coherent website? You come up with, whoops. You come up with what's called a structure chart. And a structure chart more or less looks like an organization chart. And here's some examples. You have your home page, maybe you have two alternatives underneath that. Maybe underneath that you have a couple alternatives and, and so more. Or maybe your site is structured this way. This shows that we have a home page, a page about the government, a page about news, special reports, 
policies, statistics, and services. So this almost looks like an organization chart for a company where you have the person on top, the people that are underneath them, and so on. Same idea. Finally, we have, or not finally, almost finally, we have a wireframe. And a wireframe is what I showed you uh, previously. I don't really have anything more to add to wireframe. It's sort of a view of the structure of each page. I lied, I do have something more to say about wireframes. You may only have one wireframe per site, all right? Or if you have different pages that are laid out a little bit differently, you might have different wireframes for each section. So maybe some of your pages are structured one way, other pages uh, have a slightly different structure. Now you don't want it to be too much different, right? Because you don't want to confuse the user, but it might not literally be exactly the same. And you could have come up with a second wireframe. Now, prototype. We talked a little bit about prototypes before. That's your rough draft. All right. I mentioned that you can use Greek text instead of the actual content on a prototype, not on your finished project. There's a Greek text generator where you can put in, I want five paragraphs worth, and it will give you five paragraphs of this sort of Latinish text that you can copy and paste. I'm not sure if that actually means something or not. I don't know. Oh, well, this does. All right. So you can copy that and put it in if you didn't have the actual content that you're gonna use. You have two goals with making a prototype, all right? And they sort of conflict with each other. You wanna make it look as finished as possible without spending too much time on it. Why do I say that? Because it's a rough draft. There's no point perfecting a rough draft because you might have to go back and change it, all right? Now, if you put things in a separate CSS file, that makes things changing it a lot easier, all right? Because certain aspects, you can just change the CSS file and it will change the site. So you want it to look representative so that you can show it to people and say, this is what your website's gonna look like with maybe a few minor adjustments. On the other hand, you don't want to devote too much time on it so that you complete it and only to have people viewing the site or viewing the prototype tell you, I don't like it, change the color scheme, change the way it's organized, and so on. Remember why you are creating this design document. You're creating this design document for sort of two reasons. One reason is to get your thoughts down on paper, all right? It's very easy for someone to say, oh, I got all this up here in my head. Well, yeah, uh, there was an old saying that faded ink is better than the best memory, right? So write it down or you're gonna forget it, all right? Or at least there's a chance you're gonna forget it. So by going through this process, this forces you to think through the design of the website and get your thoughts on paper. The second reason we use, we create this document is to communicate to people. We communicate both to our client, in other words, who we're making the site for, and we communicate to maybe other developers that are working on the site. Because in a large website, you might actually have a team of web developers working on the site. And maybe one of them would be responsible for one section, another person would be responsible for another section. Well, they need to know what to do, right? And if you can give them very specific requirements, it makes their job a lot easier to do instead of having to guess what needs to be on the site. Next week, we are gonna start talking about how we can take our wireframes that we sketched up and actually make CSS to accomplish those. So our next several, our next couple of lectures at least 
are going to be devoted to how we can structure our pages, how we can lay out our pages using CSS. All right. Any questions? All right. We'll see you in lab.